The uh, biosecurity landscape in which we live and work is changing. It's becoming increasingly complex and challenging. In the past three years, significant and challenging exotic animal diseases have been moving closer to Australia. You see here on the left uh, a dynamic uh, presentation of the spread of African swine fever and now lumpy skin disease. Similarly, with African horse sickness, uh, it emerged in our region in the uh, last uh, year and uh, uh, spread from Thailand and uh, into Malaysia. Other diseases, such as foot and mouth disease, remain uh, dynamic and concerning. And just to note that these maps are official reports. So African swine fever is endemic throughout Africa. Lumpy skin disease is endemic through Africa. They're not reporting it year by year. They're just reporting new, new incidences. Uh, so uh, the situation is in fact uh, more dire than is represented here. A range of complex and intersecting uh, global factors are at play, which are increasing our, our biosecurity threats. Firstly, market drivers. Uh, there's a huge demand for protein in uh, China and the Middle East, which is drawing protein out of uh, India and, and the, that uh, region right across East Asia. And uh, as a consequence, we're seeing spread of disease with the movement of animals and uh, animal products. Increasingly, uh, supply chains are complex and uh, the volumes are uh, increasing also. So it used to be that we bought a, a product from a country and the, the product was uh, entirely from that country. Now products are composite products are, uh, are formulated over a range of countries and uh, they're, they're far more immediate. Uh, so they are ordered and uh, delivered uh, in the same day. In our region, we're seeing a number of concurrent emergencies. So countries in our region are dealing with African swine fever, full army worm, COVID-19, all at the same time. The geopolitics in our region is quite uh, dynamic. Uh, we've seen uh, conflicts in a number of uh, regions uh, within our region. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we're all watching the, the situation quite closely and that affects trade and, and movement of animals and people. And of course, uh, climate change is uh, a, another complicating effect. The issues that are driving the emergence and continuing spread of diseases like African swine fever and lumpy skin disease in our region will not stop with these diseases or stop before they reach our border. And there's real evidence that the threats to Australia are increasing. So we, we tested pork products uh, uh, confiscated at the border through the mail program uh, in the two weeks leading up to Christmas and the two weeks leading up uh, to the Lunar New Year. And we found that 24% of those uh, pork products tested positive for African swine fever and 1% tested positive for uh, foot and mouth disease. And while we remain uh, disease free with more virus circulating, uh, there's more chance of an outbreak as we've seen with uh, COVID-19. So Australia's biosecurity system has been a thing of international envy, and we have long benefited from our, our formal and favourable animal health status. But given uh, the types of challenges we're experiencing, we need to anticipate in the future, are we going to be able to maintain the status quo even in the short term? So we undertook a, a structured uh, expert judgment exercise with 16 participants from the department, from the northern jurisdictions, uh, from the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness. Uh, this was facilitated by the Centre for Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis to help us answer the question, what's the probability of an internationally notifiable outbreak of African horse sickness, lumpy skin disease, foot and mouth disease, or African swine fever in the next five years? The exercise involved a robust uh, two-hour uh, discussion with individual participants making private, optimistic, and then pessimistic, and then most likely projections of probabilities. And when the prob uh, projections were aggregated, there was an estimated 42% probability of an internationally significant outbreak of one of these uh, four diseases, ASF, AHS, foot and mouth disease, or lumpy skin disease, occurring in Australia in the coming five years. 
if we then uh, break that down uh, in terms of the estimated probabilities by individual diseases, the figures are also astounding. So 21% probability for African swine fever in the coming five years. This is a pig disease, which has been traditionally associated with high levels of mortality, uh, for which there's no treatment or accepted vaccine. Recent reports of uh, virus variants uh, responsible for less signs of disease threaten to complicate the already tenuous regional situation with potential for disease to spread unnoticed and uncontrolled. 13% for African horse sickness, arguably one of the most significant exotic diseases of uh, horses with a, a mortality rate of approaching 95%. 9% for uh, foot and mouth disease, the disease that has previously been acknowledged as the most significant uh, biosecurity threat to Australian livestock industries. And 8% for lumpy skin disease, a, a virus of cattle and buffalo that is primarily spread mechanically by a range of uh, arthropods, uh, that is in insect vectors. Uh, movement of these uh, can result in progressive short uh, distance spread and movement of infected animals may result in longer distance leaps. And it's important to note that when we talk about risk, we're considering both the probability and its consequences. And with these diseases, we need to consider three key challenges. Although these diseases are different and affect different industries, they have uh, common challenges, which essentially build on each other to create a very difficult situation, particularly when we're also talking about a number of other concurrent disease events. So preventing the introduction of these diseases will become increasingly difficult now that they're in our region. Border activities and controlling imported goods remains critical, but uh, are, is unlikely to be enough in itself. The difficulties that we would face if they were introduced would be greater still. Uh, they're difficult to detect and control. Uh, detecting disease is likely to be challenging likely to be challenging in our largely extensively managed or feral animal populations in Northern Australia. We also have limitations with the tools available to us to control and eradicate uh, an outbreak. So African swine fever has no vaccine, African horse sickness and lumpy skin disease uh, have vaccines, but they're live vaccines. They're not approved for use in Australia. Uh, they essentially recreate a, a, a milder form of the disease and uh, foot and mouth disease uh, has a, a number of serotypes. So there's not one vaccine that you have to uh, type the disease and, and purchase the appropriate um, uh, serotype vaccine. Then there are impacts when we might expect if a, a, an outbreak occurs. If we were successful uh, in controlling an outbreak, there would be significant short and long-term impacts on producers, industry and across Australia animal production would suffer and trade domestically and internationally would be affected. In all of these cases, the consequences are dire. We're talking about considerable uh, animal health and welfare effects, economic impacts in the quantum of billions of dollars as indicated by past reviews, including from lost production and trade as well as control costs. And there would also be the longer term and broad reputational damage from an outbreak which could also affect other animal sectors and commodities that are not affected by the specific disease. Australia benefits from our strong biosecurity reputation and this too would be tarnished. Then there are the other public and socioeconomic uh, impacts and we're talking about diseases that can cause mass mortality and or require culling of large numbers of animals, including healthy at-risk animals, which would be considered as part of our control measures. And this would be confronting and distressing and also damaging for industries already battling uh, growing social license issues. It was uh, recently uh, in the last month or so, uh, the anniversary of the 2001 foot and mouth disease outbreaks in the United Kingdom. And 20 years on the trauma from that outbreak and the mass culling of animals continues to be acutely felt by many. I've been Australia's Chief Veterinary Officer for a decade now, and my personal observation is that the level of concern among uh, experts generally is at a level I've not previously encountered. And there's good reason for concern. 
while the estimates from the structured judgment exercise provide some interesting and concerning indications, there are limitations. In addition to the rapid and limited nature of the exercise and its participants, there was disagreement among the participants, which you might have noticed in the, from the ranges of probabilities. And although this is an expected and important part of the process, there was a high level of uncertainty expressed. The discussion during the exercise highlighted some key risks and drivers that could affect our biosecurity future, which in some ways more than the probability estimates was a key takeaway. So what sorts of things are, are working uh, against our interests? There are a range of issues that could work against us in the future, from increasing amounts of virus circulating in the region, the fact that the diseases are biologically challenging to control. As I said, ASF has no vaccine. Lumpy skin and African horse sickness have a live vaccine. Uh, they, they're, they're all uh, spread, and, and uh, certainly lumpy skin and African horse sickness have insect vectors. African swine fever has a, a tick vector. Uh, there's changing risk pathways and, and risk profiles in the region. There's increasing use of less or non-regulated risk pathways or illegal activities, as well as pressures from the concurrent pandemic and its impacts on regional biosecurity resourcing and activities. So we've seen in, in our region, a number of the veterinary services have had to give up their budget and their staff in order to support the, the COVID response in, in their countries and the prospect of complacency or fatigue. But we've got some factors uh, working in our favour. Our history of maintaining our disease freedom and the activities and the investment that have supported this, as well as the use of innovative approaches. And you might see in the budget that there's been uh, additional funding given uh, to innovative uh, technology the ongoing biosecurity campaigns. And it could be for the time being at least that these will work in our favor. Meanwhile, the, the factors such as the global knowledge gaps about some of the diseases and their epidemiology, as well as the volatile global context, for example, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on future risk pathways and geopolitics in our region translate to a high degree of uncertainty. And these dynamic or unknown factors could tip the scales in either direction and impact our future success. We are facing heightened challenges in an increasingly uncertain world, and we must work today to shape our future. And on that note, uh, as you'd be aware, the federal government's committed close to $400 million to build a more fit for purpose biosecurity system we're building a risk-based biosecurity system that effectively, efficiently and sustainably protects Australia's health, economic, environmental and national security interests against the threats of today and tomorrow. And we're working on the assumption that we will have a major pest or disease incursion this decade. And there are, and are therefore looking to ensure our preparedness, response and recovery systems are strong. Mm -hmm. We cannot rely on the activities of our past for our future success, or even to maintain the status quo. As we now face multiple threats on multiple fronts, we need to continually improve and do things differently just to keep pace with the increasingly complex, challenging and rapidly changing world. Our defences rely on depth across the biosecurity continuum from pre-border to border, to post border protection, and our agility, our strategy, and our partnerships. The shared value and the shared responsibility for biosecurity here has never been more important as it is today and will be into the future. So during today's session, I ask you to consider how your individual and our collective actions can now help to tip the scales in our favour. Thank you.